5.30. So, um, everybody welcome to uh, this Energy Club faculty series presentation. Um, today we have with us Dr. McCarl from the <coughs> Department of Agricultural Economics. And um, he has quite a list of uh, accolades. But um, he's, he's done some very interesting work, and today he is going to talk with us about um, biofuels and kind of the policy and economic impacts um, of them. So anyway, let's give a warm welcome to Dr. McCall. So did any of these things advance slides? Um, haven't actually gotten that far. Let's try this. All right. So I believe it was the white one. That's NEC. That's probably. Oh, yeah. policy and economics, although I'm willing to bet two-thirds of you are for the engineering school. <laughs> Isn't that right? Uh, yeah. yes. and, and you probably do policy and economics like a lot of ecologists in business in, in agriculture do, which is, sure, we do that, and then somebody hacks up a little policy and economics. But <laughs> you're probably better than um, I want to do something relatively light today. And I didn't actually know what your background was, but I've also been traveling a lot, so I refit something. Um, I was at Argonne National Labs yesterday. Uh, so I refit something I've done before, and let me just talk through it fairly quickly. I'm going to talk a little bit about bioenergy and why we might have bioenergy, why we care about it. Um, and I'll talk about some issues in the future as to whether we can maintain our bioenergy. Um, what I'll talk about when in the why have it also applies to a lot of other forms of energy. The first thing I want to say is that most people, at least a couple years ago, when they talked about bioenergy, really thought about ethanol. Um, today, we're under a mandate uh, under the Energy Independence and Security Act by 2022 to produce about 20% of our liquid fuels in the form of bioenergy. Uh, that is about 15 billion gallons of corn ethanol and about 15 billion gallons of cellulosic ethanol and then the other six gets kind of lost in the woodwork. Some of it's imports from Brazil of sugar cane and ethanol and things like that. But bioenergy is a lot broader topic than ethanol. Uh, it certainly includes crop ethanol. Today we're making about 15 billion gallons. So about 5% of our energy requirement is coming out of corn ethanol. I guess about 10%, close to 10%. In 2001, we made about 600 thousand gallons so today we make 15 billion so that that industry has expanded close to 30 times in a 10-year period it went from consuming about three or four percent of the nation's corn crop to producing about 40 or consuming about 40 percent of the nation's corn crop in that 10 years as an economist one thing that we worry about a little bit is it also went from corn being two dollars a bushel to corn now being about seven dollars a bushel and that's causing some problems here and there um, causes problems with livestock feeders the price of meat conceivably there were tortilla riots in mexico because um, the corn became too so expensive that a lot of people use corn-based tortillas and it's causing some problems in Brazil and places like that we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, the second item is cellulosic ethanol. This is where we take something like wood, perhaps this thing, although it's probably plastic, 
and somehow make it into energy by first getting the starches and sugars out of it and then migrating those into a, an ethanol type product. The third thing that we're talking about today is a bunch of different alternatives. I wrote pyrolysis here, but there's also butanol and, and other forms of energy that people have talked about. The pyrolysis path is where you heat something like that to 3,000 degrees in three seconds and it liquefies <coughs> a substantial amount of it. And then you can take that material and, and refine it or you can combust it immediately for electricity. Biodiesel is another form where we take soybean oil or plant oil or McDonald's french fry oil and add esters to it and convert it into a diesel-like product. And then biofueled electricity. This is perhaps the best of these. I'll, I'll talk about it in a minute. The main reason it's the best is it takes a lot less energy and effort to light a match to something than it does to try to convert it into something you can drive your car on. Um, and so I want to talk through a bunch of those different things. Now there's four reasons why we'd be interested in bioenergy. In the 1970s, everybody wanted to convert all kinds of products into energy. We had people that in Oregon wanting to convert potatoes into energy and sugar cane and corn, etc. But in the late 1970s, we had the Arab oil embargo. Energy prices were high like they were today. Lots of interest got started on that, but then those energy prices collapsed back down and we had gasoline, I think, in the early 2000s in the neighborhood of a buck and a half a gallon or something like that. Um, and maybe a little lower than that. So, and, and all the bioenergy talk stopped when that energy went way back down. I mean, the, the barrel of petroleum, when I moved here in 1985, in 1977 it was up in the $70 range. In 1985 it went under 30. Um, now we're back up, what is it, somewhere around 100 right at the moment? Mm -hmm. uh, it might be a little lower than that, although I noticed it the gas prices went back up, so it must be jumping back up. But energy prices is a real reason why you might have substitutes. Energy security, I mean, we're concerned about bringing stuff from the Middle East and other parts of the world that may not be as politically stable as we'd like. Greenhouse gases, and there, there's policy um, satisfaction. I'm going to talk through some of these, although I'm not going to spend much time on energy security because it's rather Now, in the 70s, there was quite a bit of interest, and it died out. Four to five years ago, it began again. Pre-1900, we were a bioenergy economy. We got, you know, our, our we, we put uh, wood into cars, or into trains, and, and heated our house with wood. The usage diminished in, 1900, in the 1900s. It was largely due to the availability of cheap fossil fuels in the when they it had their, one of the early oil fields is just south of here near Hempstead. It's a little bit further south than that. And when they drilled holes, it literally came out of the ground. They didn't have to pump it or anything. So that was quite cheap. The question is now, as energy prices get a little higher, will they stay higher and will they promote bioenergy? Now, has anybody ever heard of peak oil theory? You guys study that somewhere or another. Well, this graph has been around for 15 years. Every time you look at it, this peak seems to shift. It was over here a little bit earlier. But notice what this thing here is saying is in about 2010, about right now, we expect globally that the amount of conventional oil we can pump is going to start reducing. And this is proven to be true in the United States. About 1970 is when the U.S. peaked, and today we're substantially lower than this. The reason that Sarah Palin and all them are running around saying, drill, baby, drill, and I think our governor has now jumped on that bandwagon, is um, 
and the pipeline up there that comes into Valdez, Alaska is about 50% as utilized as it was 20 years ago. So they'd like to have more oil to fill that up. And it's because the fields that they've explored up to now have peaked out some and they're, they're working down here on the, the other side. Um, the theory is that globally this is going to happen. Notice the Middle East here it doesn't happen too awfully much, but most other countries it is happening in this graph more. And there was a recent article in Science saying that they have detected that we may be on the other side. Um, now prices obviously have some influence on this. I mean a few years ago you saw a lot of rusting oil rigs around here. Today, most of those areas seem to have fresh, shiny equipment in it, so the higher prices are stimulating a lot more exploration. But the issue there is when we start thinking about developing other sources of oil, we start getting into things that cost more money. So enhanced oil recovery, which you know, this fracking stuff and putting carbon dioxide and that sort of thing in there develops more oil, but the price is more like $60 a barrel than it is this $20 a barrel that we've lived on a lot up to now. Right at the moment, we've used about this much. We still have this much in reserves out there, but eventually we start getting into this more expensive stuff. And this one here is the tar sands in Canada, which were producing fairly actively up until a year or two ago. When prices came back down, they stopped producing some of it because it was just too expensive. The oil shales in western Colorado and other sorts of things fit that story. And what this really means is, yes, we can produce almost eight or nine times what we've already produced, but it's going to cost us some more money than what we've got. Going into the energy industry now with you and your brand new degree is not entirely a bad idea because in the future there's going to be higher prices, is what this says. Um, economists always worry about supply and demand. So what I've talked about so far is in the future the supply is likely to be more expensive than it is now. But let's look at the demand side. The projection is that between now, 2010, and 2030, that we're going to have you know, a third, 25% to a third more global consumption. If you talk to anybody from China and who's here studying for a degree right now, and you ask him when you were a young kid, were there as many cars around as there are now? The story is heck no. I, in China, I think Beijing's probably, there's somebody here who may know this, but I, the last couple of times I was there, every time I go, they add another ring road. And when you're driving around, everybody's had a driver's license for about two or three years. It's kind of like playing bumper cars over there. <laughs> um, so it, it, but you know, most of our PhD students that come over here to study never drove in China. They're getting their driver's licenses here. And as a consequence, we see a big expansion, most of it in what we call non-OECD Asia, which is India and China and, and a bunch of other countries there, with large increases in demand. So what that says is large demand growth, especially in the United States and in Asia, or in North America. We're also having a big influx of people here. This is the state demographer's projections for what's going to happen to population in Texas between 2000 and 2025. This particular number, I think, is around a 60% increase in population. This number here is about an 80% increase in population. So, if you think the roads around Houston are bad now, just wait. They're going to be worse. Um, now, historically, people use about the same number of barrels